good and bad are perspectives, so each of us determines that. The karma affects our future, <coughs> not just our future now, but whenever we die, if there was karma left that we hadn't finished up, then that is the karma that causes us to be reborn again. So if you didn't finish all your job, you know, finish all the karma off, you're going to come back. Uh, moksha is the ultimate goal. Moksha means liberation. Uh, it's one of the terms. They also use mukti, which means freedom. And then the Buddha just decided to use a completely different term, and he used nirvana, and all that simply means is to extinguish. Like we extinguish a flame, we put it out, it stops, it ceases to be a flame. It doesn't mean that it ceased to exist completely, it just changed forms. And in, in this case, your Hindus would say it's now back into its pure form, back to God in its pure form. <coughs> there are rituals that Hindus do. The main ritual that a Hindu does is puja. This is a worship celebration uh, in their home. They offer things to an image, they meditate on that image, they do their uh, divine chants. There's also a naming ceremony when you're born, the ear piercing ceremony, hair shaving, um, bathing in the Ganges. So there are lots of rituals, lots of rituals. The major holidays in Hinduism, Diwali, Ganesh Chaturthi, Holi, Krishna Jamashtami, Hanuman Janti, Mahashivatri, Navatri, Rakshabadan, Ramadavami, and Guru Purnima. Diwali, which is the one that's coming up, it's the festival of lights. It's not just really a Hindu holiday because the Sikhs and the Jains and the Buddhists, they celebrate Diwali too if you live in India. And uh, the idea is that it is the light overcoming darkness, or good overcoming evil, or more accurately, light in Hindu metaphor, in Hinduism, Hindu symbology, light represents knowledge, and darkness represents our ignorance. So the celebration of light overcoming the dark is us becoming enlightened and shedding off the veil of ignorance. <laughs> Ganesh Chaturthi is the celebration of the elephant-headed deity Ganesh, birthday. Krishna Jamashtami is Krishna's. Hanuman is Hanuman. Um, Ram Navami is Rama. Mahashivatri is the big celebration to Shiva. Holi is the celebration of spring and of the destruction of the demoness Hol uh, Holika, who's burned by fire. Navatri is the nine nights dedicated to the different forms of the mother goddess. It's celebrated both in the fall and in the spring, and it ends on Dusura, the 10th day of victory. Guru Purnima is the day in which Hindus often celebrate their spiritual teachers. And Rakshabadan is the day in which brothers honor their sisters. And then there's another celebration which happens during Diwali uh, called Badush, which is when uh, sisters honor their brothers. So it's reversed. Badush. Badush. Um, dietary codes. Traditionally, most Hindus are vegetarian or vegan, but there's nowhere in Hindu scripture where it specifically says that meat is prohibited. Um, as one Hindu guru, when asked, uh, must you be a Hindu, they say, try out the foods. If they disrupt your meditation, then don't eat them. Or if they do something bad to your body, don't take them. If they're poison to your body, you don't put poison in your body. Is Hinduism exclusive or inclusive? Obviously, by the answer before, they're inclusive. Hindus don't look at other religions as... Uh, being different. They just look at them as different paths. There's a, a metaphor that says God is like the ocean and the river and the and the different religions are like rivers. All rivers merge into the same ocean. You may call it the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, but in the end it's really just one ocean. And it doesn't matter what river you take, you're gonna end up back there. And that's kind of a Hindu aspect. <clears throat> so how do you reach God? There are different paths or mo margas. Uh, or yogas uh, that Hindus talk about. There's bhakti yoga, which is the uh, path of devotion. This is where people do prayers and they sing music and they dance and they involve themselves in the art. And in bhakti yoga, um, you're in a relationship with God. Uh, God is either your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your best friend, your lover, or your enemy. Which might seem kind of strange that enemy, but as Hindus say, so long as your mind is thinking about God, you'll still get back to God. I can't be a Hindu. 
<clears throat> there's a Hindu story about a guy that goes around and he's known to be a thief and he walks up to a sadhu, uh, a wandering ascetic guy. And he goes up to the person and he says, you know, give me something. I'm trying to, you know, I want to rob you. And the person says, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to give you. And he says, no, give me something now or I will kill you. And the sadhu says, well, I will give you a mantra, a mantra that I think you'll really like. And so the, the person who knows that a sadhu won't lie says, all right, yes, give me one. So he says, your, your mantra will be Mara. Well, Mara in Sanskrit means evil. He says, I want you to chant this day and night. Well, of course, the thief thinks, oh, this is perfect. I'll be more evil then. Yes. So he goes and he chants it and he chants it and he chants it and much time passes. And eventually he comes back out from chanting it and everything. And he's suddenly this really nice and holy person. And people are like, what in the world happened? We don't understand. So they go running to the sadhu and says, what happened? What happened? He says, oh, I gave him the mantra Mara, but if you chant it over and over again, Mara, 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 becomes Rama, 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 which is the name of God. So eventually, he, in a way, the sadhu kind of tricked him into saying a name of God, which gave God the door into making holy. <laughs> so, Bhakti Yoga, chanting any name of God. Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is the, karma, is the uh, path of action. These are people who do, uh, when they wake up in the morning, they'll do certain rituals and they'll say certain prayers. These are people who, um, the, the best way to describe your karma yoga is um, you do all things, uh, the Bhagavad Gita says that you can't stop from not acting. You always have to act. But in order to not have the karmic consequences of those actions, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita it says you must act, but not act because of the rewards that you'll get, but instead act because it is there for you to do. So an example. If you go to work, instead of going to work because you get a paycheck, you simply go to work because it is the job that has been put before you to do. And then when you get the paycheck, you offer that paycheck first to God. You know, you set that out to your altar and everything like that and pray about how you should spend the money before you go and spend it. And it's God's money, not your money. Then that's what karma yoga says. That, that, that pulls the karma away because you never accepted the reward, so it's not your reward. You don't call it your work, so it's not, you're not making any attachment to it. That's karma yoga. Jnana yoga is the yoga of knowledge. This is where people will read the books and read and study and read and study and read and study. And the catch to Jnana yoga is after you've read and studied it all, then you have to forget it all. So. Raja yoga is meditation. That's studying and doing the meditation techniques and the breathing techniques. Tantra is a, a way in which you take techniques and you take living in your daily life and you apply it. Uh, and then there's Hatha Yoga, which is for physical exercises. When most people think of yoga, whenever you see people doing the exercises and it's called yoga, that's Hatha Yoga. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that heaven and such were uh, temporary. Hindus, again, the goal is God, not heaven. They believe that between incarnations, we do reach a heaven. And that either um, the heaven is either wonderful and great because our karma was wonderful and great, or it's really bad because our karma was really bad, or if we die consciously, which is many Hindus' goal is to die consciously aware and thinking, then whatever it is that we are thinking when we die, that is what our heaven will be like. But heaven is just temporary because, again, heaven is not God. The goal is God. So heaven is just a temporary state, and you will be moving back again. So in other words, don't die in a car wreck because I think all you're thinking is, oh, shit! <laughs> all you're... They always say that, generally speaking, one example used by one book, <coughs> the, the author of the book that was describing this uh, teaching, likes ice cream. And they said, so, I really like ice cream, and I die thinking about ice cream, and so I go to heaven where I can have all the ice cream I want. Eventually, that's going to get really boring. Really and boring. turn into a cow. <laughs> and so, ultimately, when we get bored with heaven... We have karma that's going, okay, you've got to go back because I'm still around. And so we'll incarnate again. You're going to try to die thinking of snow and carnivals, warm snow and carnivals, a never-ending carnival. Then I'd say that for a long time. In, and fireworks. When it comes to God, Hindus generally describe three words that, that describe God. And they're in the Upanishad, which is a sacred text. Sat, Chit, and Ananda. Sat is being or truth. Chit is consciousness, and Ananda is bliss. 
So when they talk about God, it is being, existence, consciousness, and bliss. That's the way that they, those are the three words that they found to just try to describe God. They generally say that you can't fully ever know or understand God because it's beyond our comprehension. And in the Western religions, we'll see that Judaism and Christianity and Islam say, you know, don't even try to talk about what God is like. 